I would like you to welcome you all to uh, the latest instalment of uh, Young Icebreakers Lectures. Um, it's a great pleasure for us to have you all here today, as it always is. Um, for those of you who don't know me, uh, I am the co-chair of the Young Icebreakers. Um, at this point, I would usually uh, give you an idea of the upcoming events, but we're going to take a slight break over summer uh, before we ramp up our activity for autumn. So please keep an eye on emails, um, website, etc., uh, and all that kind of jazz. Um, it is uh, a great honour for us to have uh, the chairman of Vodafone, uh, Gerald Kleisley, speak to us today about uh, Western uh, multinationals and their experiences in China. So we welcome him. Um, but uh, before him, we have an, another great honour to have uh, <laughs> Richard Reed, who is a, a long-term supporter of the club uh, and a great partner of the club, uh, say a few words. So, Richard, thank you. Adam, thank you uh, very much indeed, and good evening to everybody. Um, as Adam says, my, uh, my name is Richard Reed. I'm chairman of KPMG here, here in London. Um, and it's a huge pleasure to have you all here. Um, I am a big, big supporter of, the, uh, of, of making business relationships between the UK and the West and China even stronger, as many of you know. Um, and one of the ways to do that, clearly, is to work more closely together and understand cultures and so on. So we're extremely lucky, as Adam said, to have... Uh, Gerard here tonight, um, who has an enormous amount of experience in working with China and with multinationals in, in China, um, having spent the majority of his career with large German and Dutch uh, headquartered companies, particularly with Philips, where he was uh, the CEO for 10 years until uh, 2011, and I believe was with the company for 37 years um, in total. Um, so I'm not going to say any more other than to hand over. I don't know if Stephen is going to say any, so what you just say what I'm going to say, it, or <laughs> hand it straight over to Gerard, whatever Stephen uh, okay. uh, would Lovely. like to do. But anyway, enjoy the evening, and Gerard, again, thank you very much yeah. in advance. Um, for being here tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Richard, and thanks uh, KPMG for hosting us in Canary Wharf. It's uh, a bit of a journey. For me. I think I've been to Beijing more times than I've been to Canary Wharf. So <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for hosting us here. It's a lovely building, a lovely facility, and uh, very enjoyable to be here. You've kind of done uh, the introduction. Uh, I've got one thing to say that the actual pronunciation of Gerard's first name is Shirard. Hmm. You see? <laughs> which has just been coaching me on, which is the proper Dutch pronunciation. And there is an interesting Second World War story, but we won't go there now, will we? No, um, it's, it's too But, the, <laughs> but um, you know, one of the ways in which the Young Icebreakers work is that we organize speakers who I want to hear. <laughs> I have to tell you that. And when I met Shirard, um, at uh, a Huawei event, uh, immediately he mentioned the Philips background and the significance of being chairman of Vodafone. I knew there was an interesting set of perspectives and dimensions, and I'm sure they will unfold over the course of the presentation and the Q&A that will follow. So I will stop there and Thank let you go right ahead and uh, talk to you. our young icebreakers, plus a few grey hairs. Thank you. Well, yes. <laughs> I try to stay with the young icebreakers. Yeah, <laughs> At Vodafone, we also we were a very young company, so we were a no tie office, and I came straight from the office uh, to here. Uh, and this is a lecture for short speakers. <laughs> <laughs> uh, or you need. It's my pleasure to be here tonight and, and to share with you uh, some of my experiences uh, in dealing uh, with China and doing business in and with China. And I say specifically doing business in and with China because the two not for all companies always go together in a, in a harmonious way. Um, ever since China under Deng Xiaoping opened up to foreign business and to foreign multinationals, of course, China uh, with its huge market, its labor potential, uh, its dynamic economic growth 
has been and must be at the forefront of every business leader uh, in the world almost. And it has to be said that, that first experiences uh, have not always been positive. And I guess several of us here in the room, many of us will know the stories of Beijing Jeep and other companies that were very early entrants, uh, where apparently the parties had not get used sufficiently to each other's way of doing business. And actually there was a black book in the US about all the bad stories that happened to businesses that went to China. Gradually, I guess, both sides learned from their mistakes, and, and that was the start of the FDI boom uh, in China. My personal relationship uh, with China goes back to uh, the mid and, and late 80s. Um, Philips uh, was a very early entrant into China. Actually, Philips established his first joint venture for audio products uh, in Beijing in 1985. And I joined a business group called Display Components in 1986 in Philips. And Display Components is, at that time I was making picture tubes, okay. radio, uh, TV and, and data display tubes. And in 86, Philips, uh, Philips Display Components had started discussions uh, with the city of Nanjing to establish a picture tube factory in Nanjing. An interesting backdrop to that story is that actually uh, the picture tube project in Nanjing was supposed to be part of a contract between the Chinese government and Toshiba of Japan to build five picture tube factories in China. But since the people in Nanjing still were very aware of the events of the, Jap of the, uh, the massacre of Nanjing, uh, there was little appetite in the Nanjing community uh, to invite uh, a Japanese to make a joint venture in Nanjing. And, and that actually was for us the opportunity to make a counter-proposal and the start of a long, intensive and good relationship uh, with the people in Nanjing. Uh, all the negotiations at the end of the day took five years and so in 1991 uh, Huawei Display Components was established, incorporated, um, and became over a period of almost 20 years one of the largest and most successful picture tube factories in the world. And, and the basis uh, of many more joint ventures that Philips uh, established in those years. Philips benefited, I guess, from, from two earlier decisions. First of all, since the 20s, Philips had been established, well established in Hong Kong. Of course, the trading hub in the area, also a trading hub into China, certainly when China started to open up uh, after the, in the Deng era. And the other one was that uh, as of the early 70s, Philips had started to build up a manufacturing presence, predominantly in components and semiconductors and computer peripherals in Taiwan. And Philips had grown over the years to a company that, uh, that employed more than 10,000 people in Taiwan in, in several factories. And what that did was not only that it gave us uh, an Asia, a strong Asian presence, it also gave us a cadre of well-educated, well-trained, experienced factory and business managers with a Chinese background. Because, because many of the people in Taiwan, some of them were indigenous Taiwanese, Aboriginal, but most of them had come being born in the mainland, had come from Shanghai, Nanjing, and etc., and had their roots there. And so both our strong industrial presence in Taiwan with the leadership we had there, our trading and commercial presence in Hong Kong were good stepping stones when China opened up not only to move into China, but also to move into China with some understanding of the Chinese way of doing business, doing negotiations. Although, I must say, we found out that 50 years of, of let's say, communist, uh, being closed in the communist regime, and a Taiwan being open more sort of to the American way of doing business had created also quite some differences between Taiwan Chinese, mainland Chinese, not to speak of Hong Kong Chinese.
for me, that was the start of a long relationship with China that over the years only got both deeper and wider. And one of the things that, that I learned from my Taiwanese friends very early on is the concept of Guangxi. And, and I'm, I'm getting myself now into trouble with all the native Mandarin speakers here. Huh? But the, the thing I, le I learned is, Io Guangxi, Meo Guangxi. <laughs> Meo Guangxi, Io Guangxi. Which, for the non-Mandarin speakers, means having relationships, that's not a problem. Not having relationships, that's a problem. And in China, everything is about relationship. And relationship is more than drinking Shaoxing or Mao Tai and having extensive dinners. It is about making a real investment in each other. Over time, with consistency and continuity. A real effort to be able to see things also from the other person's perspective. And I think being able to see things from a Chinese perspective, instead of complaining about unfair practices here, an uneven playing field there, uh, adverse regulation, etc., etc., trying to understand why these things are the way they are, put them in a total context and say, well, if I look at the way Japan developed its economy, Korea developed its economy, even today in the United States, IP practices are being done. Is it so strange that it's not a straightforward Western European way of doing when you go into China to participate in that market, um, to take advantage of the abundance of well-trained but still cheap labor, uh, to be able to participate in this huge growing 1.3, 1.6 billion people market. And many times over the years, in my conversations with Chinese leaders, they said, well, yeah, but we have opened up our market to you. To what extent have you opened up your market to us? And I see that still today in, in our Vodafone business. Um, I can say that for Vodafone, in Europe and in Africa, Huawei is one of our major suppliers. But in the US, Huawei is banned from supplying to companies that provide government services. Here in the UK, Huawei is vetted by MI5 or 6, or whoever is responsible for that, that there are no backdoors, there is no secret software, there is no spyware, and that this equipment can be used. But also we have many restrictions that make it different for indigenous Chinese businesses to be part of our world. And, and I've seen, over the years, we ha I have seen many hurdles that we had to overcome. But at the end of the day, I always have to say, I've never been disappointed in China. And if today, under the new leadership of Xi Jinping, again, uh, here in the UK, we look at GlaxoSmithKline, there are more of these where we see what you could call more regulatory repression. Uh, people complain that the local firms are being ad advantaged. Well, go to many countries around the world and tell me in which countries, to some extent, the local firm does not have an advantage and, and even expects to have that advantage. So, what are we complaining about? The key elements of Guangxi are trust, consistency, and continuity. And that always has been my way of dealing with business in general and certainly dealing with business in China. By the mid-90s, as Philips, we had established 35, over 30 joint ventures. And then as of the early 90s, mid 90s, it was also possible to have wholly owned foreign enterprises. Mm. But we started only with joint ventures. And every joint venture, we had a different partner assigned to us by the local government. We had a different board structure. Every venture was responsible for its own sales. At that time, as a company, you could not have a Chinese sales organization yet as a foreign multinational. And so we only could loosely coordinate, which we did largely from our Hong Kong offices, all these activities, still with a long-term vision, 
to build over time a Phillips presence in China. And as time unfolded and wholly owned foreign enterprises became possible, having as a foreign multinational a Chinese sales organization became possible, consolidation across joint ventures, certainly in the same province within the same fiscal regime became possible. Because of course you needed these joint ventures because there was local subsidy, local incentives, and you couldn't take that out of its legal context because then that would drop away. But over time we were able to put that all together. In 1996, I was posted to Taiwan to become the CEO of Philips Taiwan, the head of the component business in the region. And, and uh, one, one and a half year later, uh, my CEO asked me also to take care of the greater China region because not everything in China was going the way he liked it to see. And then again, there was a step, I was every week in Shanghai, a step further in building my relationship with China, with the Chinese business people, the people that, that were our partners in the wholly owned foreign enterprises. And then in 1999, I was called back to Amsterdam to succeed my predecessor and become the CEO, President of Philips. And, and, and that was, of course, the most interesting period because then I was responsible really for driving the total activity of Philips in China. And my first visit on the handover trip with my predecessor uh, was to China. And, and of course, like, like any sort of multinational that has a local presence with a local manager that wants to show that he's well connected, uh, they had arranged a visit with the prime minister at that time, Zhu Roji. Zhu Ji had 10 minutes to spare for us. <laughs> and of the 10 minutes, after the courtesies had been exchanged, he spent most of the time to explain to me that I had a little problem to resolve. And the problem was that um, at that time in Europe, there were two reasonably sizable anti-dumping cases running against uh, uh, picture tube manufacturers of small size picture tubes in general but in particular from China, and against manufacturers of uh, uh, light bulbs, and particularly uh, energy saving light bulbs. And of course, being the large European picture tube manufacturer, and being the, large, the largest lighting company in the world, Zoology rightly had to assume that Philips was one of the driving forces behind the anti dumping case. And again, this is, so we're opening our market to you, what do you do? So, my homework was cut out for me. And, and of course, on one hand, the anti-dumping cases were triggered, you could say, for the right reasons. And so we tried a two-pronged approach. On, on one hand, we worked with the European authorities to see where we sort of really were the real pain points, uh, who were the real culprits. And on the other hand, we worked with the Chinese Industry Association in lighting and in electronic components, um, first of all, to educate them on what was going on in WTO, what were the rules and regulations of international business and trade, how did the EU look at dumping, and what could you do to mitigate anti-dumping Etc. And what, what mitigating measures could be? And so we worked on both sides. We also helped the Chinese to deal with that. And um, after a period, we saw that um, the well-coordinated China, because the other thing I found out, of course, is that official China across China was much better coordinated than official Philips. No, because we were a multi-divisional, we had all these GAVs, lighting didn't know what semiconductors was doing, semiconductors had no clue what audio and video were doing, etc. But when you looked at the total, you saw, ah, there's a meeting being cancelled here. An approval there takes a little bit longer than we had expected. A contract that we thought we would get, we didn't get. But nobody added that up of, hey, you have an issue to resolve. Until Zuwaji <laughs> told us. So we started to work on, on all of it. And gradually we saw things improve. We saw the press coverage was negative for some time. We saw the press coverage improve. And then, of course, again, 
in the meantime, being a large, having a large presence in China, uh, having a strong organization that I had moved from Hong Kong to Shanghai, uh, a visit to China was, of course, more than due. And as part of that visit, of course, the culmin, the high point, had to be a meeting with the Prime Minister, at that moment, Mr. Ben Jabao. And as these things go, they take ample preparation. So my China team says to me, yeah, I think this year we're going to have a meeting with the Prime Minister. I said, okay, when? Yeah, we don't know exactly, but maybe uh, this week, that week, that week, or that week. I said, okay, that's fine. This week is fine, that week is fine, that week I can accommodate. it. Please stay away from that week. <laughs> that was the week. And, okay. <laughs> Time goes on, we move into the year. Uh, yeah, no, that week is not possible. It has to be that week. I said, I told you to stay away from that week. I can't count that week. Yeah, it has to be that week. I said, okay, fine. Uh, with a lot of effort, if I jump into the company chat and I go overnight and I go back, I can manage whatever I have to manage. And so, so I say, okay, if it has to be that week, it's this day, that day, not this day, and that day. Time goes on, and the message comes back, yeah, Mr. Premier Wen will receive you, and he will have time for you, and it's going to be a great meeting, but it's on that day. I, said, I can't come. No, you can't do that. And of course I couldn't do that. The reason I had blocked that week was because our son was about to graduate from university in that week, and the precise date of the graduation ceremony hadn't been fixed. In the meantime, that had been fixed. It was that day. So I would miss our son's graduation. And that's a hard thing in the life of a father. So I call my son, and he says, yes, that's your lousy father, but of course you have to go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because I mean, if a whole organization has worked for years to put something right, which was not right, and you get a recognition for that officially as a company. Of course you go. So I jump in the plane, I go. Ben Jabao had half an hour for us. After an hour we still were talking. We talked about all kinds of subjects, about doing business, about globalization, about China's role. And you could notice that as of that day, so the word had gone out to a thousand officials in China that Philip was, again, so a persona grata, an okay company. And you noticed it in everything we did. Later that year, in December, Premier Wen was about to visit the EU and the Netherlands. And there was one thing particular in the relationship between uh, Premier Wen and the Netherlands, because when he was responsible for agriculture in earlier life, he had been posted for some time in the Netherlands. So there was a link between him and sort of the agricultural side of the Netherlands. And the Netherlands, of course, had a program, as we always have if a foreign dignitary comes and we want to show our flowers and our agriculture and our dikes and what have you. And Premier Wen had two requests. He wanted to talk with our Institute for, for uh, Infectious Diseases, because this was in the SARS period. And he wanted to visit the headquarters of Philips. Mm -hmm. And the whole De Hague was upset. What is it that Premier Wen wants to do at Philips? And he insisted. And to visit the, um, the um, Institute for, for Infectious Diseases, and go to Amsterdam, and do another thing that he had to do that evening, so sort of logistically was impossible. Now, I had, I had good connections with the Dutch healthcare minister who was responsible for the Institute of Infectious Diseases. And he says, Gerard, can I turn your headquarters for an hour into our headquarters? <laughs> I says, what's it? Yeah, because Premier Wendland needs to visit this, and we can't logistically put that together. So, yeah, of course, you're welcome. So I was a guest for a whole afternoon of Premier Wendland first, because we sort of mimicked the headquarters of the Institute for Infectious Disease, and he had a meeting there to talk about SARS. And then he visited our headquarters and looked into our researchers. 
That evening, we had a state banquet in The Hague. All the dignitaries there, my industrial colleagues from Shell and Unilever. And Premier Wen, he puts his paper speech, like I do, aside, because I never speak from script. And he says, I'll speak from the heart. And he talked about his connections with the Netherlands, of course, the agricultural thing. And then he talked about great companies like Philips. And my colleagues at the, uh, the table from Shell and Unilever look at me and say, what have you done to deserve this? <laughs> <laughs> that's Koji. And that's, that's how, at the end of the day, it works. And it, it works because we made a real effort to work in and with China. We consulted if we had an idea. Where shall we go? Do you have a recommendation with whom we can partner? We had lots of issues about intellectual property, of course. But what do you do? Chinese industry was making the majority of uh, CD players, audio players, you name it. Lots of technology from Philips inside. Nobody was paying a license fee. And we wanted to collect license fees. So you have to organize the industry. We did two things. We worked with the industry association. But we also instituted, both in Tsinghua University in Beijing and in Fudan University in Shanghai, an IP chair. Because in the discussion with the government, it was clear that, of course, the government looks further ahead many times than industry. The point will be there where Chinese industry will create its own IP and needs its own IP protection. Mm -hmm. And needs to understand how IP works, how you do that. So we made an investment in IP in China. And the government will help us to enforce. And we also learned that the arm of the government was always, not always as long as we thought it was. Because, of course, if, if you take counterfeit, at a certain moment you find out that, that there's a whole city in China that lives from counterfeit products. And it's the local economy. And of course, the local mayor and the local police are not going to raid these companies and take away these jobs. And you also have to understand, <laughs> to some extent, respect that and deal with it in a way. Is okay. How can I mitigate that so that it doesn't hamper my business too much? There's a, a visible difference between a Phillips shaver and a counterfeit Phillips shaver, a Phillips light bulb and a counterfeit Phillips light bulb. And then you live with that and you move on. And we started to collect intellectual property rights. We got money out of China. And it's one of these, these things where I say, if you make the effort, if you try to understand how things work, if you also recognize that at that point China was in a place where maybe the Netherlands was 70 years ago and the US was 50 years ago and, and Japan was 40 or 30 years ago, and you look back at and how were things in Japan. I mean, in the Netherlands, we didn't have intellectual property rights. Phillips, Phillips was based on the fact that there was no intellectual property right. We just copied Thomas Alva's Edison's light bulb. <laughs> and, if, and if you have that in mind, okay, fine. Every nation has to go through a path. And, and if you come with your thinking, your way of doing, I mean, being on the learning curve already for decades. Step back and think where you were or where you would have been at the beginning of the learning curve and, and, and try to understand that other people need an opportunity to go on the learning curve in many ways and, and make their own way. As a consequence of, of our engagement in China, um, I had and have still many contacts. I mean, I was then I was invited to be an economic advisor of uh, Jiangsu provincial government because we had many establishments in Jiangsu province. I'm an honorary citizen still of uh, Nanjing city. Um, I was in, uh, on the advisory board of the School of Economics and Management of Tsinghua University. And, and in that context, because uh, uh, ex former premier Zhu Ji still is the honorary chairman of the board of that business school. So every time we would go to an uh, annual meeting of the uh, Tsinghua uh, Management School uh, Advisory Board, we would meet with, he, would, he was always there, Zhuangzi. And so I could joke with him, I said, and, and say, Premier Zhu, 
you gave me a task. You said I had a problem to resolve. I think I can report back to you today. The problem is resolved. And of course, we had a good laugh about that. And, and, then, and then life moves on. Um, in that effort, uh, we, we also had solicited the help of a Chinese think tank, the, the China Reform Forum, mm -hmm. uh, at that time led by a gentleman called uh, Zheng Bijian. And, and Mr. Zheng is probably in his 80s now. Uh, he had been an advisor of Deng Xiaoping and, and subsequent uh, leadership. He was close to, to Wen Jiabao and Hu Xintao. And he became a good friend and, and also on, on a personal level, family to family almost. We had, we had dinners uh, at the time. And, and he helped me a, a, a great deal in also in something. He's the, the architect uh, with his uh, think tank of uh, what is called uh, now China's peaceful development. Uh, in the early days, it was the, the peaceful rise of China, but then China decided that rise maybe was a little bit too aggressive, so it's peaceful development. And, and I was always impressed by the, by the thoughtfulness, the long-term horizon, the, the huge issues that, that China and its leadership were aware that they had to resolve. And, and which needed all the energy. And, and so and that, that fits with the approach that, that we took. Of course, as a businessman, you try to do what's good for your business, what's, what's good for, what creates value for shareholders. But you try to do it in a way that if, if you go in a country, that, that you also have an answer to the rightful question of that country, what are you doing for my country? Yeah, because because that's, that's also what business there. And, and again, the fact that an increasingly Chinese leadership would ask you and will ask you, that's all nice and fine. And certainly now where foreign direct investment is not necessarily the first thing that China is or should be after. You will then get that question more. But then again, look at, our, look at the UK. I mean, the issues we have with some foreign multinationals that operate here, the likes of uh, Starbucks, uh, Amazon, etc. Uh, where, where you also say, okay, fine, you're doing business here. What are you doing for our country, for our society? And you get that question in a very legitimate way, also in China. And I think if you, if you want to make your way in China, you need to have an answer to that question. I mean, I've seen China develop uh, from the early days where it was initially foreign direct investment, the manufacturing base for the world. It was factories. Gradually, as the, uh, the middle class developed, it was products. And you had two things. You had people manufacturing in China for the world, and you had people importing products into China for the middle class. And of course, increasingly, you had to move to a situation where you did in things in China for China the Chinese way. So one of the last things that I did in my presidency in my, as the CEO of Philips uh, in 2010, I, I took my, my top 100, to, in, in this case, to Suzhou. Uh, and we, we uh, had a forum and, and, and working sessions for four or five days exactly on that topic. Because what I had become to realize is that, that of course, uh, with the development of the Chinese market, any company that had a 20, 30% share of the Chinese market, by world scale, was a large company. Although outside China, nobody might have heard of it. So I would say to our appliance people, you have to look at, com at this company and that company. No, no, no. no. That, that's, a, that's a small company, it's only active in China. Yeah, but that company is bigger than you are. And as soon as the day is there for them to move into Asia, not to speak of the world, they will crush you. And, and to make my people aware of, of that fact, you have to see it with your own eyes. And you have to be able to understand how to do things in and with and for China the Chinese way. We acquired a couple of companies in the healthcare field. Very interesting. Why do you acquire that company? Because it has a good low-end product range that suits the Chinese market, but of course also suits, this was in this case uh, ultrasound and patient monitoring, patient monitoring equipment. Not every hospital needs the most sophisticated of GE, Siemens and, and Philips. For simple tasks, a simple piece of equipment, with a simple specification, but good quality and a low cost, also will do the job. So we found this company, and we got some competition at the low end from the Chinese mind ray. We found another company. And then you get this question, of course, the Shanghai people come in on behalf of Philips with all their Philips policies and procedures. As I got there, there goes my cost. Because take a simple thing, salespeople. 
Phillips salespeople, also in China, would go to a three-star hotel, they would travel uh, by plane or by car, car was driver. The people of the company we acquired in Shenzhen, they would sleep in a one-star hotel and two in a room. They would go by public transport by bus. Yeah. And if you mix these two worlds too quickly, too easily, of course, you forego the advantage exactly that you acquired the company for. And to see these things firsthand and to be able to sort of gradually move, not ahead of China, but in pace with China. Because in a couple of years, also Chinese salespeople will not sleep too in the room anymore. Yeah? But we're there when we're there. Yeah? And, and to do these kind of things and, and really also we, we brought R&D to China. Also R. We filed patents for Philips. We developed and filed patents for Philips in China. 100 in the first year, 300 in the second year, 1,000 in the third year. And so you, you had an answer when, when, when the Chinese government created the policy, all the way to the previous government, of indigenous innovation. We could say we have indigenous innovation. These products contain R&D developed in China for China. And, and if you go along that path and you deal with the issues that you have, I mean, GlaxoSmithKline needs to deal with it, but then you need to move on. That's not a reason to get discouraged with China. Some people have pulled out of China wrong. Hurdles are there to be overcome, and if you talk with your partner in a mutually understanding way, you will overcome them, and you will find the next step, and you will be able to make your next move. So I've been, in my now almost 30 years of experience with China, always positive, rarely disappointed. Yes, we had difficulties, not everything went the way we wanted. Uh, we had to close some joint ventures, we lost some money now and then, but over the whole, we did well. We had market shares comparable to what we had elsewhere in the world. We made margins comparable and sometimes better than we made elsewhere in the world. And I'm still a big believer in the future of China. China needs to change. It is changing and that is a difficult and painful change because you get addicted to foreign direct investment. And it's not easy to get away from that. But there is already too much capacity of everything almost in China. So it's about developing the local market, which means moving up the value added ladder, having better paid jobs for better educated people, creating more local added value, do more local R&D, and create more products in China and for China, which the Chinese people can afford, and thereby create this flywheel positive flywheel of higher income, higher disposable, more purchases, more consumption, economic growth, driven by consumption, not by foreign direct investment. That's, uh, I can talk for all hours. Yeah. <laughs> China is uh, something that uh, is dear to me. Uh, I'm going there this weekend. Um, and, um, but as an introduction, uh, and as a few thoughts to leave with you, uh, I would like to stop here and then in particular Look forward to uh, some challenging, interesting questions, which for me always are the most interesting part of uh, the conversation. Um, all right, I'll keep it short. So welcome to KPMG and welcome to give us the um, speech. I have two questions, I'll keep it very short. Uh, the first question is, uh, Vodafone has recently confirmed its talk with Liberty on asset swap. Do you think that would be another, another deal very similar to BTE? That's my first question. The second question is, you were saying um, you are very interested in the uh, development in China and um, Vodafone has been quite engaging. And as far as I'm aware of, the uh, Vodafone and China Mobile has jointly beat a uh, mobile license in Myanmar um, back to 2014, which unfortunately didn't happen. Uh, but in the meantime, I'm also glad to see Huawei has been the global supply of uh, Vodafone Group. Going forward, uh, where do you think the uh, Vodafone's engagement will be with China and with Chinese companies? Mm. Thank you. Um, first question, no comment. 
<laughs> and I suspect. The, the, the newspapers are better informed than I am, and they make their own stories. Uh, but, but, but Vodafone has confirmed that there is some exploration, uh, and, uh, and not, not more than that. Um, on on um, China and China Mobile, um, Vodafone was a, what is it, a 2.3% shareholder for some years, I think, in, in China Mobile. And I guess uh, when uh, Vodafone took that stake, the intention on both sides was that maybe that could develop into some larger form of cooperation. Over the years, nothing materialized. So in 2010, Vodafone decided to sell that stake in, in mutual consensus with China, with China Mobile. So Vodafone is, uh, as a service provider, on the consumer side, not active in China. Not with Vodafone. Brand. What Vodafone does is uh, we have Vodafone Global Enterprise, which serves global multinationals for their global communication needs. As far as these needs needs need to be served in China, we take care of that as well. But we do that through partnerships with our partners in China, the likes of China Mobile. Yeah. Um, and, 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 and that's at the moment where it is limited. At. Yeah, because you know that, that uh, telecommunications is one of these industries that is sort of fairly tightly regulated. There's hardly an opportunity for a foreign multinational to participate in, in, that, in that area in a meaningful way. Uh, David Stringer Lamar, Fortis Consulting London, Chairman of IOD, City of London. Uh, thank you very much for sharing your uh, thoughts about the collaborations and challenges uh, that you experienced in China. I'd like to flip it the other way around and ask you, what do you think are the biggest challenges for Chinese companies looking to do business in the UK or indeed Europe, if you prefer? Yeah, um, I, I mentioned one of these challenges, that is suspicion. Yeah. Uh, because, of course, we all enjoy many, many products from China, but they come through us through mostly Western brands. Uh, and, and so Chinese, Chinese products still are in, in a minority. Um, there is an increase in, in uh, foreign investment from China into the rest of the world, although all the relationship, I think, still is inward to outward one, two to one. There's still more going into China than going out. But, there is an opportunity. There is a huge amount, of course, of money available in China to be invested, uh, for which there is in China itself not enough opportunity. Uh, that's also why you have this new Silk Road initiative, which is money going out of China being invested. So I think we just need to have, again, an, an open mindset, an open attitude, and, and be in fighting and not afraid. I mean, foreign direct investment for us is also good, and, and uh, money has, in that sense, no color, and it should not. Uh, hello, Jared. Uh, my name is Yu Li. Thanks you very much uh, for sharing your old stories, fascinating stories in China. And you talk a lot about uh, guanxi and its vital importance in China. And actually, we Chinese um, use that uh, all the time to solve different kinds of issues. I think in, in, in general, it's a lack of trust among strangers. And in Western country, you solve that um, by contracting. And in China, through uh, guanxi, the social capital. Okay. However, guanxi is very important, uh, but uh, more often, uh, it leads to unexpected surprise down the road. So my question, first question to you really is, what is the, uh, the most unexpected surprise you've had through your guanxi in China that you will never forget in your life? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think, I think uh, the one that for me stood out most, I, I just told you. <laughs> that, that was an, uh, so certainly, have you had those experiences? Certainly in the Netherlands, that was an unexpected result. Uh, and and uh, we have done well with that, I think. Um, Yes, yeah, so sometimes uh, you, st you also in, in China you see. But there's another example that I, I also learned through publicity that that Philips had dissolved uh, half a year ago or so. One of its medical joint ventures in, in China was China Nijoft. and and there I think the Guangxi was good, but you could you could notice that that uh, sort of the the ambitions of the two parties were diverging. 
and, and, and you work hard at it, and you are oh, getting it right. Getting it. And, and at some point, and, and in that sense, there's not really a surprise. Uh, you, also, you also have to be realistic in that and say, okay, fine, we have, we have diverging objectives. Uh, it doesn't make sense. Uh, we need to part ways and stay good friends. Okay, so, so you're lucky you haven't had those uh, yet, all right? No, did I have sort of in, in, in oh. negative surprises where I think, I, I thought we had a relationship, mm. and now you're letting me down or you're taking uh, unfair advantage or so? Not really. Mm. I think my, then my second question is related to this. And as a foreigner doing business in China, you had some experience, of course. Um, in, in China, you will often find people say something actually they mean differently. For yeah. example, in China, they say basically there's no problem. That means there's a big problem. Sure. Uh, and and uh, <laughs> when they say yes, doesn't mean it's an indication of confirmation uh, or agreement, something mm. like this. How and how do you find yourself in dealing with understanding really what what what, what well, do they mean? Well, I, I guess you don't have to go far. I, I, initially, I want to say we, we already learned a lesson in Japan, where where you you have, you, you run into sim a similar cultural problem, eh? where where saying no is not not the, not the obvious thing, um, but. Let's, let's just stay in the UK uh, uh, as, as a Dutchman. Um, I also have to, had to learn <laughs> that if in the, in the UK somebody says, that's a bloody good idea, <laughs> <laughs> then you know what that means. <laughs> have you had your Chinese counterpart say, basically, you don't, and you don't understand our country? That means they really don't disagree or uh, really, really disagree with you and they just want to work away from the contracting. So, do you find it's, yeah. uh, it's on, on down the line when you're doing a contract, you have more problem through Guanxi or no, no, it, it is because um, one of the things that uh, that I've learned, I think, very early is that um, by the time you need your contract, you already are in deep trouble. Okay. And and um, let's say sometimes it helps in a contract if you do a JV to spell out. Uh, the rules of separation, the opt-outs that, that people have. So some of these things, to think ahead of it, as okay, if you want to split, what are, what are the rules of disengagement and not of engagement? Um, it helps, uh, but at the end of the day, uh, many times also in our sort of contractually regulated Western world, uh, you need to have a conversation and you, need, and you need to come at a compromise. If you end up in court, yeah, you know where, where you're at. And, 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 and I think we, we in the West are, are a far too litigious society already uh, with a risk of further going, uh, going downhill in that respect. Yeah, we've got three questions. Four, four, hmm. Can I suggest we just take all the questions and then we give Sherard uh, one second to answer all four questions. But okay. otherwise you don't, but if you could give your questions very fast. Sure. This uh, microphone coming. One's there, one's there, one's there. Um, okay. So you have talked about the uh, importance of Guanxi and that it has clearly benefited from Guanxi. So um, if you want to give some advice to Google, who clearly have tr some trouble with the Chinese government, what's the step to step guide would be? Okay, next I, I, question. I, sure. well, we'll take all the questions. Next one. You can um, think about that one while <laughs> Yes, um, because you have uh, this Ting Zhang from China Business Solutions. Um, you are is essentially in the Chinese we call old hand with China because you have so much experience. I wonder, in the last dec you know couple of decades, you've been doing business in China. Would you say China is now getting easier as a foreign business in China, or more difficult, particularly with you know now more Chinese company up against you know hmm. Western competitors and also the general business environment. Okay. Can you give the microphone over there? Okay. Oh, yeah. Hi, this is uh, Louis from, uh, uh, I'm uh, Secretary General of Tsinghua Alumni Association in the UK. So I've heard the, the name Tsinghua mentioned in your speech for about five times. So thank you very much for that. Uh, my question is, uh, as the top guy, as the chief executive of such a large organization, uh, how much, in terms of proportions, what proportion of your time is spent on China-related projects, and how does this proportion evolve uh, as time goes by in your uh, almost 30-year experience? Thank you. Okay. The last one over here. Um, I have a very similar question to the lady 
Kitty uh, just raised. Uh, given current uh, anti-corruption campaign um, that's been going on for a few years, from, business, uh, from a business point of view, would you say it has made it easier for you to do business in China or in a way uh, a little bit more difficult to do business in China because uh, some local officials prefer not to do anything? Um, and uh, the current anti-corruption campaign has been compared with very close to Cultural Revolution. What's your take on that? Okay. See, the best questions always yeah. come at the end, don't they? Well, um, <laughs> I'm not the one to advise Google uh, because mm. I, I don't know in detail what the issues are and how they could be resolved. Uh, in, in general, I think I, I've given you the answer that it's, it's up to the Google people to, tr to try and understand what the, what the issues from the Chinese side are and, fi and find the common ground. And, and you, you can't walk in neither the European way or the Dutch way or the American way. You go to China and you have to be able to do things the Chinese way. Um, on um, time spent, uh, hard to say. I think in, in parts of my uh, 10 years as CEO, uh, it's very well possible that I, that I would, would have spent a third of my time on China. Uh, simply because it was the biggest growth opportunity. Uh, we had large investments going there. We had a large amount of people. We needed to build up uh, the, the, the talent base. Uh, and, and you needed to do that by visible presence and leading personally. Uh, so yes, I've been uh, forth and back uh, quite a number of times. And, 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 not, and not just in China, but also doing China business reviews with the business people here who had to give the support, etc. On uh, has China become easier or more difficult? It's a little bit uh, difficult for me to judge because I say my, my, my hands-on experience, of course, is, is not as direct anymore as it used to be a few years ago. Um, it's different. Um, most foreign multinationals will say we do business, in, at least as far as ethics is concerned, in China in the same way we do everywhere in the world, so we don't engage. That does not exclude that no, nobody can say, hey, you don't know what you don't know. Let me say it in that way. So that in general, we should applaud the fact that uh, widespread corruption is being tackled. Uh, in particular, also to the benefit of the Chinese citizen and the Chinese consumer who gets a fair treat. And, and so, going through a difficult period, at the end it will be better. In this, now, you know what the biggest problem is? Is, is, is not the anti-corruption campaign itself, but the sides and the unintended side effects that it has. Because a lot of Chinese officials now sit on their hands. Because they are, they are afraid to move, not for, to get caught do having done the wrong thing. And, and, and that's maybe a, a problem at, at the moment. Yeah. Uh, for, for the rest, we're in a different phase. As I said, China needs to move, and, and the Chinese leadership knows that better than anybody else, from a foreign direct investment-led economic growth to a local consumption-driven economic growth. And that's a hard change that requires higher income for people, so higher wages, uh, better social security, because only then will you have fewer savings. And the savings, and only then will get the savings go into investment and consumption again. Yeah, and and that's, that's not easy to do in a society that has been used, let's say, to easy foreign money. Can I leave it at that? You can leave it at that. Come and sit down. Let me, let me um, before we show our appreciation in the normal way, Gerard, um, I, I just found that fascinating. You can see why I wanted to have Gerard speak. Is if we go from the small anecdotes about... Uh, meeting Premier Wen Jiabao, to the big issues of how you change from an export-led economy to a domestic economy. We look through all the issues of how Chinese and Westerners relate to each other, and the differences between working in China and understanding and accepting China's ways, and the difficulties for China in operating in other countries and understanding the ways other people work. Through this talk, yeah, the main, all the main aspects of the development of China and the development of China's relations with the West. Um, probably the one area we didn't touch on, and uh, a bit later I'm going to ask you about this, but not uh, in, in, in this group unfortunately, is does the Silk Road present an opportunity 
in an area which is neither Chinese nor Western for China and the West to find new ways to work together. It's a very interesting opportunity that develops in the world over the next 10, 15 years with the Silk Roads, with uh, global development, their attention, their opportunities. And it'll be interesting to see which come through. And I picked up from what you said there that uh, I didn't understand the question about the debt swap or whatever it was that was asked, but I got the impression that Vodafone's business in China is not totally limited by the narrow constraints on telecommunications. But I won't press you on that because you didn't know. <laughs> no, it's interesting. The, uh, uh, I talked back in 2003, 2004, both to the European and the Chinese leadership about building a new Silk Road. Really? between Europe and, and China. Because I mean, to me, this Silk Road concept, I understand what, what it is, but it is a limited concept because it, just, it, it stretches out a little bit out of China, but not all the way back into Europe, certainly not into Western Europe, which is where Marco Polo started his journey. Yeah. <laughs> and, and so, and, and that, that's to lack of vision and initiative also on the, on the European side to a yeah. large extent. So my dream would be to really build a Silk Road between Europe and China because we have all ties that connect us. And I've always been uh, fascinated by the interest also that the Chinese leadership had in Europe and the European project. Where, where sort of yes, sorry, coming from two angles at the same issue, China keeping a diverse territory with different languages, different groups together and creating prosperity. And Europe uniting different cultures, different languages. Yeah. Um, in some years we may be able to judge who has done a better job. At the moment, <laughs> I'm almost more positive about China than I am about Europe. <laughs> in that well, respect. as a committed European, I'm in favor of voting yes in the referendum for reasons very much connected to it. <laughs> so, uh, ladies and gentlemen, can I thank you very much indeed, Gerard, on behalf of us all. And, uh, I thank uh, KPMG very much indeed for your hospitality, the Young Icebreakers, for organizing it all. And uh, I should say that in, in due course, Gerard, we will ask, be asking you to become a fellow of the 48 Group Club. And I can't promise you that uh, Wen Jiabao will pre present the award, but uh, we'll try to find somebody special. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.